The video was prepared especially for the AK Cashin channel. Greetings, friends. In today's video, we will continue to look at Soviet microchips and discuss useful elements like flip-flops. A flip-flop is a device capable of storing one bit of information, meaning it remembers its state. It is fundamental for building counters, which we will talk about in the next video. Let's figure out how a flip-flop works and what types of flip-flops there are. Let's start with the 2 input NAND gate microchip. Next, we'll connect two elements according to the following scheme. This is the RS flip-flop circuit. The inputs are the set for setting the flip-flop and the reset input for resetting. And there are two outputs, direct and inverse. The value at the inverse output is always opposite to the direct output. Let's look at the truth table, which shows all possible states of this flip-flop. We apply a 1 to the inverse inputs S and R. This is the so-called storage mode of the flip-flop. Next, I will use red to indicate a logical one, and blue for a logical zero. Suppose there was a 1 at the Q output. It will go to the lower NAND gate, resulting in a zero at its output, which will go to the input of the upper NAND gate, and its output will be a logical one. In other words, the state does not change. Now let's change the scenario. The flip-flop was reset. There is a logical zero at the Q output, and the scenario changes symmetrically. At the top, two ones give a zero. And at the bottom, one and zero give a one. The state of the flip-flop is maintained, which is why. This is called the storage mode. Now we apply a zero to the inverted S input, and a one to the R input. This is the set mode. A zero on the upper branch results in a one at the output of the NAND gate. At the bottom, two ones give a zero, meaning a logical one is set at the Q output, which is why this is the set mode. Now we apply a zero to the inverted R input and a one to the S input. This is the reset mode. A zero on the lower branch will result in a one at the output of the NAND gate. Two ones at the upper NAND gate will give a zero. A logical zero will appear at the Q output. Therefore, it's the reset mode. And the last combination is the forbidden mode when both inverted inputs R and S are set to zero. During the action of the input signals, the logical levels at the trigger outputs are the same, and after their action ends, the trigger will assume a random state. It has almost no practical use, which is why it's called the forbidden mode. If you implement an RS flip-flop using NAND or NOR gates, the truth table will be as follows. S and R are no longer inverted. Zero and zero, storage mode. 0 and 1, reset, 1 and 0, set, and 2 ones, forbidden mode. This was a regular static RS flip-flop, which can maintain its state indefinitely as long as there is power supply. There are also synchronous RS flip-flops, which change their state based on the signal voltage at C. That is, you prepare the necessary signals at the input, apply a pulse to the C input, and the state changes. However, Everyone was bothered by the forbidden state of the RS flip-flop, that it exists and is useless. And that's why D and JK flip-flops were invented. A D flip-flop is essentially an RS flip-flop, where the set and reset signals are combined through an inverter. That is, they are always opposite to each other. The D line comes out externally. If we show it using the previously assembled RS flip-flop as an example, a zero on the one will set the flip-flop, and a one will reset it. But, usually the logic is different, not inverse. You apply a 1 to D and set the flip-flop, apply a 0 and reset it. There are no other states, no forbidden zones. A JK flip-flop is essentially the same as an RS flip-flop, with its input signals fed through in gates. Due to the introduction of feedback, the forbidden combination of the RS flip-flop and the JK flip-flop performs the function of inverting the state. Let's look at the truth table. 0 and 0 give the hold mode, 0 and 1 give the reset mode, and the lower and gate will open to pass the 1. But when the state of the output Q changes, it will appear there, 0. And the flip-flop will switch to hold mode, 1 and 0, and we get the same scenario when setting the flip-flop. The 1 goes from the inverted input to the upper and gate. The flip-flop changes its state, after which it switches to hold mode and two ones will cause alternating state changes. Let's say the flip-flop was reset. 
the one from the inverted output will go to the upper end gate and set the flip-flop upon the arrival of the signal edge C. The state has changed. Now the one from the Q output goes to the lower end gate and resets the flip-flop as soon as the edge arrives to the input C. If you need a flip-flop in a circuit, it's not necessary to make it from logic gates like NAND or NOR. It's more appropriate to use ready-made chips that contain RS, D, and JK flip-flops. These are TR, chips with RS flip-flops. TM, with the flip-flops, of various configurations and TV with JK flip-flops. For example, let's take the 155TM2. This chip contains two unconnected synchronous D flip-flops. Let's connect everything according to the following scheme for demonstration. We apply a 1 to the D input and give a pulse to the C input, and the 1 appears at the output. However, each of the flip-flops has R and S inputs, which allow setting and resetting the flip-flop in asynchronous mode. That is, not by the clock input, but as soon as possible. So, to set a 1, we need to apply a low level to the S input and a high level to the R input. And to reset the flip-flop, it's the opposite. Well, let's go over a couple of circuits using these chips. For testing the functionality of such simple circuits, it's convenient to use breadboards. The circuits are electronic switches for various purposes. And more correctly, to implement such circuits, use the 561 series microchips because they have ultra-low power consumption thanks to the CMOS design. And the first circuit is a switch with a single push button. Since the flip-flop has an inverted output, it is logical to assume that if you assemble the following circuit and connect the B input to the inverted output of the flip-flop, pressing the button will toggle the flip-flop to the inverted state. This is, by the way, the so-called D flip-flop. However, in practice, the push button has contact bounce. That is, at the moment the button is pressed, multiple toggling of the flip-flop actually occurs. I will discuss the various ways to deal with this bouncing in a separate video. One of the simplest methods is to place a capacitor on the button line. However, this method is not very reliable and is not recommended for use in finished devices. I do not advise it. But, in the TM2 chip there are two flip-flops. We will assemble the second one according to the T flip flop scheme. And we will form the pulse and switching using a monostable multivibrator implemented on the first flip flop. A monostable multivibrator is a device that generates a pulse of a specified duration upon a trigger pulse. That is, at the moment of the first edge. When the button is pressed, a logical one will appear at the output of the monostable multivibrator, which will switch to zero after a certain time t. Now let's figure out how the monostable multivibrator works. It should be noted that I will demonstrate using a TTL chip as an example. The CMOS logic will be similar, but it has its own input and output characteristics. In the circuit we connected, the D and S inputs to the power supply through a resistor. The C input is connected to ground. All of this is necessary to reduce the influence of interference. The R input, however, is connected through a resistor, diode, and capacitor to the inverting input and power supply. When the power is connected, a logical one appears at the inverting output. The flip-flop is reset, it is waiting for a pulse at the C input. The R input is in a high state. We apply a pulse to the C input. The flip-flop is set. A logical zero appears at the inverting output. The capacitor begins to discharge through the resistor. The voltage at the R input drops. When the voltage drops to the threshold value of a logical zero, the asynchronous reset will trigger. That is, a logical one will appear at the inverting output, which will charge the capacitor through the diode, equalizing the potential on the capacitor. In principle, the diode can be excluded from the circuit, but then the recovery time will increase. Let's take another look at the entire switch circuit the button, as a source of an unstable pulse, a monostable multivibrator that forms a stable pulse, an AT flip-flop that changes its state with each pulse. Instead of a button, a microphone or a wire that picks up interference when touched can be used as a pulse source. However, in such a case, it is better to use a set of microchips with high input impedance. 
For switching the load, you can use relays, transistors, or triacs. For example, I integrated such a circuit into a lamp. Plant lighting, powering the LEDs through a KT819. During operation, nothing heats up, and you can do without heat sinks. A regular button is good, but with two trigger microchips, you can also create a simple code lock. Let's take a look at the circuit. Essentially, there are four T triggers in sequence here. The necessary buttons send pulses to the C inputs, so that the logical one can pass from the first trigger to the last. The appearance of a logical one on the last trigger will cause the capacitor to charge. Upon reaching the required level, the transistor will open and a logical signal will be sent to the R line, a zero, which will reset all the triggers. The rest of the buttons from the control panel are also set to the reset line. An electric drive from a lock, for example, a car lock, can be connected to the output of this circuit. And by varying the capacitance of the capacitor, you can adjust the lock opening time. However, it's better to assemble this circuit using the 561 series triggers, because they have ultra-low power consumption, which is very important for such tasks. But an important drawback is that if someone knows which buttons are part of the code, but not the sequence, the lock can be quickly opened by random pressing. However, the lock can be made more complex by adding additional trigger chips and discrete logic. These are some interesting chips. Triggers are basic elements for building various complex circuits. If you like the video, don't forget to support me with a like and comments. Subscribe to the channel. This was Andre with you. Goodbye.